This meeting is being recorded. Got it. There's a custom that I'm in the shop that from Passover until Shavuot, the seven weeks, right? So the seven Shabbats. So that, uh, sorry, seven weeks of the six Shabbats. For it. So um, if you don't include the, um, so the what, yeah, yeah, exactly. In between, within the, within this, it's seven exact. It's, one second, why is there seven? Why is there not seven Shabbats? I'm trying to figure this out. I don't know. Um, the six Shabbats from past. Well, from when we say from past, we mean from the beginning of the Omer. So, from the first day of the Omer, which is on the second day of Passover, until Shavuot, there are forty-nine days. Um, so, within in between that time, you have six Shabbats. It's customary to learn Pirkei Avot, Pirkei Avot, ethics of the eth, eth, ethics of the fathers which has six chapters, to learn a chapter every one of those Shabbats. The first week we, we read um, the, the Shabbat after Passover, we read chapter one, and um, it goes in that, and continue, and then the, follow, then the following week, chapter two, and the one before Shavuot, we read chapter six. Now, Spirki Avot is, um, and in Chabad, the custom is to continue to do this until Rosh Hashanah, so we actually end up going through Pirkei Avot I believe three or four times, I think four times altogether. Um, so it's the week after Shabbat, we start again, chapter one, and we go, we continue from there. The Pirkei Avot is very interesting. Um, it's very interesting tractate, Hi Noga. It's very in- interesting tractate in, in the Mishnah because it's different than the rest of the Mishnahs which are talking about Jewish law. So many of the laws in the Shulchan Aruch are based on the Mishnah. Pirkei Avot deals with ethics, morals, how we should um, how we should act in our behavior beyond what we're just obligated to do according to the dry law, but more than that. Um, as, as I believe some of the one of the commentaries set, calls it, um, this is it's called Mili de Chasidut, which means the the way of being of Chasidut. Chasidut is we obviously associate Chasidut with the Chas, Chas, with the movement of Chasidut and the different groups of Chasidim. But chasidut is a, is a word in Hebrew, which means, comes from the word chasid, which means kindness. And it's a way, it's a way of behavior. People are more, are more, um, are more, um, trying to find the right translation in English. It's not, not just more kind, but more um, refined, more, eth- more, um, you know, try to live in an ethical way in every aspect beyond just keeping the law as it is. The being pious, pious is the word. So the, it's 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 being pious. So now, in last week's Torah portion, the second portion. So it was a double portion last week. We the, the beginning of Bechukotai, which is the last portion of the of the book of Yikra of Leviticus. The Torah tells us the Hashem starts off saying that if you will follow my laws in Bechukotai Tilechu, Es Mitzvosai Tishmor, you'll keep my mitzvahs and you'll do that and you'll fulfill them. And then I'll give you rain in its right time, and I'll give you I'll give you produce and and um, and food and everything else that you need, and the enemies will will leave you, and you'll have peace in the land. And it, it continues for a number of verses to talk about the different blessings um, that will occur to the Jewish people if they will keep the laws. Last year we spoke um, in depth about those verses. We gave a class on Hashem turning towards us to give us the kindness. This is obviously the way things usually work. If we do, if you you hire somebody to do a job, you hire a worker, you pay them for their effort. So Hashem says, "I'm giving you the mitzvahs to do. I'm giving you the Torah to do. These are the these are the laws that I've given you. You do them like I've said, and I will give you the reward. I will give you the payment for your actions, for your deeds." There's a law. In Jewish law, there's many different laws about about hiring, about employers, employee 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 relationships, and and generally, how um how is an employer treated, and and um and different different occurrences that could happen that might um that might um re- that the payment will reflect what, what ha- reflect something that went wrong or something that that happened different than the plan that was put in place in the first place. So what if somebody hires a worker? It's according to Jewish law. Somebody hires I, I hire a gardener to plant seeds in my yard and to grow um, to grow plants, uh, fruit, whatever it is. 
And what ends up happening is, is that they put in a lot, a lot of effort and a lot of investment. But the, the, whatever the reason is, the crop doesn't grow. Or only a very small amount of it grows and not enough to pay back the investment. So there's a loss. Not only there's no profit, there's a loss. So in this case, we've got two amounts that maybe the, so either you could look at it from two different ways. Either the employer should pay, either the employer should pay the amount that grew. So I hired you to do a good job in my field. So you came and you did a bad job. So mm -hmm. I'll pay you for what I actually came out with, which was the, the smaller amount. But that means that you, the hired one, is going to lose because you put in more investment and you got back less than what you invested because that's what ended up happening. Or we could say what's the more ethical, correct, halachic way also, and this would apply in, probably apply in, in laws in our country also, is I hired you to do a job. You did your best. You invested. So I should pay you for your investment. It's too bad that I lost out. That was that's my my bad luck that I hired you and maybe the rain didn't, the, there was no rain or it was whatever it was. You did your job. I should pay you for your investment. Even more so, let's say let's say I, somebody has a sick relative, and they say you know they hire two people to go and and prepare food for that person to go and bring them something. The relative lives far away. Say so go bring certain things for them and go go travel and bring them food or whatever it is, and. The, one of them goes or both of them go and they find that the person has already died. So they made the long trip. They bring them the food. This is a case in Jewish law. And now the person is no longer, the person, they couldn't do anything. It wasn't like there was no, nothing came out of it. The investment, so to speak, nothing came out of it. So I hired you to go and take a, day, a day's trip to travel all the way to the other side of California to bring something to somebody. The person isn't there. That's too bad. I hired you for that. So I have to pay you for your effort. I have to pay you for your trip. So this is all basic halachic. This is basic halacha law. And it's also what makes the most sense ethically. You did what I asked you to do. I pay you for your effort. Now you could have a case when somebody is, let's say, what if the gardener comes into my field without me asking them to? And they start planting, planting seeds. And, and the crop grows, and actually there is profit. So now there's a question, should I pay, do I pay, since I didn't hire you, do I pay you for what you, do I, do I have to pay you for what you did? So we say, of course, you have to pay because you gained something from the other person, whether it was with permission, without permission, with that, those are specific details, how it worked exactly, and what kind of no permission there was, but... I gained something from your effort. I should pay you for the, for the gain. If, obviously, if you put in more investment than, pro, than what came out, than the profit, then I'm not going to have to pay you for more investment because I didn't hire you. I'll pay you for what I got. I'm not going to pay you for more than I got, even if you put in more effort. There's a Mishnah in the end of Chapter 5 of Pirkei Avot, of Ethics of the Fathers, which says as follows. Remember that Pirkei Avot is, is Hasidut. It's piety. It's beyond the letter of the law. It's not what we have to do according to basic halacha, but it's beyond the le beyond the letter of the law. It's extra, as is known in he is named in in Torah lifnim mishurat hadin, beyond the letter of the law. Ben Hehe says, I, I sent this out in my email yesterday. Ben Hehe Omer, we'll talk about it in a second who Ben Hehe is. It's a funny name for somebody. Hehe, two Hayes. He says, Lefum tsara agra, according to the pain, according to the effort, according to the tired, tiredness of the, the, the pain of the work, is the reward. So you get paid according to your effort, according to your investment, according to the pain that went into it. Hmm. Now, what exactly is Ben Hehe adding to what we know already based on this week, last week's parsha, where the Torah tells us if you follow the laws, you get paid? And that's obvious because Hashem owes us, Hashem asked us to do the mitzvahs. So if you, we do the mitzvahs, we should get the reward, even if we don't produce enough, even if we, if the, let's say we don't transform the world to the way Hashem wants it, us to transform it, but we did what we had to do. So Hashem pays us. Hashem gives us the rain, He gives us the crop, He gives us everything, He gives us peace, gives us everything that we need. So what is Ben-Hei adding when he says that Hashem should pay us according to the investment? 
Obviously, we put in effort, we put in tire, tire, tireless, pay, painful work. Hashem should pay us back with the reward for our efforts. There are many different explanations on this on this mission. We're going into a bit of an in-depth and analysis of what is exactly is this mission adding onto what we know already. Why is this beyond the letter of the law? This is not beyond the letter of the law. Letter of the law. This is basics. I do the mitzvahs. You pay me the reward. Well, a mitzvah is not something that you pay for. The whole idea of a mitzvah is that you do it for the sake of doing a mitzvah. Beautiful. So that's a, this is a great. This is a different angle of way of looking at it, which is the saying. So why should we get paid anything? We do what we have to do, and we'll, we'll deal with that momentarily, or, the, or in a few minutes, we'll deal with that. So that ultimately, there's we aren't, we shouldn't be owed anything. We are, we're not, we're not hired workers. We are created by God for one purpose, which is to transform the world. But before we get to that, that detail, that point, let's first look at it from a, from the from the place that we're coming at, which is mitzvahs. Hashem says, you do the mitzvahs, you get paid. And then there's beyond the letter of the law, where Hashem is telling us according to the pain is the reward. What exactly is this dealing with? Robin, you were going to oh, say something? Oh, no, no. But here it says, lefum ta'ara agra, or in English it says, I can't even read the English, come and straight with the painstaking effort is the reward. So that's different than what you're saying. It's more about the painstaking effort. I understand, but the painstaking effort means the investment, means the work that I put in. Right, but, but I think that um, when you say investment, to me, investment and painstaking or tsa'ara are two different things. Tsa'ara has in it the tsa'ar, the pain, where investment usually is, I don't know, Investment. When I say investment, I don't mean a transactional investment of, of, of money over here. We're talking about investment as in how much, well, ultimately it does add up in money. But the point is that how much did I give of myself for this purpose? Right. So investment, not how much I spent on the seeds which I planted. How much time did this gardener schlep, dig and weed and pull around in the field and put painstaking effort into the field? And they, they should get paid for their efforts. So we're not talking about... We're not only talking about paying back the, the um, expense of what was actually spent financially. We're talking about paying back for the time and the effort beyond that. So that's so when, that's what I mean when I say investment. I know, but what I'm trying to say is that even though you're using a different word, it feels differently. Like when you say painstaking, it's deeper. You're right. So according to the painstaking effort is the reward. But even this is not is not a chidush, not so to speak. It's not. It doesn't doesn't add anything to what we know already, which is we do the mitzvahs and then we get paid for it. Mm-hmm. What is, what is the extra point of it? That according to the painstaking effort, the reward, of course, according to the investment, there is the reward even more so. If there's profit, then you should pay me for the profit, not just for the not just for the painstaking effort. Pay me for what you got out of it. So let's say my time was worth fifty dollars. The painstaking effort I put in, and you and you go and sell the crop for a hundred dollars. So not only do you pay me for the painstaking effort of fifty dollars, you pay me a hundred dollars, because that's how much you made out of it. That's how much profit there was. But if he makes, if he gives him all the profit, then what's left for the person that owns the place? Okay, so, it's not the profit. We'll say that when we say so, he's gonna make a, He's gonna make a cut. Whatever. There's we can. We're, we're not. There's so many ways to. Examine this and look at it. Let, 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 okay, not the profit. You know, let's say it's worth a hundred dollars, but he sells it for one hundred and ten dollars. Mm-hmm. So he finds by it's the worth of it. You know, the mark. The, there's the um, if, depending on how, depending on where he sells it. Does he sell it wholesale? Does he sell it in the store? You know, we can make an extra few dollars out of it. That's that's what that's what the landowner does. But ultimately, he's not only going to pay me for my time and effort. Otherwise, I'm not going to make anything from it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna come out. So I'm gonna make something. I'm gonna make. I'm, I'm only gonna kind of make back what I put in. But I'm not gonna make anything extra out of it. So there's so much. There's so many ways to look at this. But ultimately, what is the, pay, what is the painstaking effort which brings reward beyond what Hashem is already obligated to give us in doing what His commands? 
and it's good. And what you mentioned before is a good question because ultimately he's not obligated to give us anything. So this guy is this um this Ben Hehe. Interesting. The commentary say why was his name Ben Hehe? It's Hehe, two Hays. Interesting name, right? Yeah. Because he was a convert. And there's, we know that Hashem added a hay to Abraham. Mm. And Hashem added a hay to Sar- Sarai. Mm-hmm. Sarai. So there are two hays which represented the conversion. Basically, <laughs> Jewish. Hashem made them into his, Hashem made Abraham and Sarah into the chosen ones, into his people. He said, now that, now that, you know, now that you're taking on the covenant, I'm going to give you an extra hay in your name. So this hay is connected specifically with converts. So when hay was a convert, a convert is not obligated in essence to do the mitzvahs. A convert was was a convert was that doesn't have the obligation to do the 613 mitzvahs. So when a convert accepts upon themselves the, to do all the mitzvahs and starts to do them, they are, so to speak, taking on something extra beyond the letter of the law. Mm-hmm. Similarly, like, the similar idea is when we take on to do something beyond what we actually are obligated to do according to the Torah. So if we take on to do something from Pirkei Avot, something extra in our, in our service of Hashem, then, then the point over here is that Hashem also is going to pay us for that as well. Pay us for that effort too. So but hey, hey, who really represented this idea because he was a convert and he really understood and appreciated the fact that I took this on my, from voluntarily from my own choice and still Hashem is going to pay me according to my effort even though he didn't ask me to do it. Now, but ultimately Hashem wants us to take on extra. So again, it's not like he went without permission. And went into the field and went and started gardening. Hashem wants it. So if Hashem wants it, then he should pay us fully for the whole thing. So I think this is this is really the the point of it is that we were created with a purpose of serving Hashem. That's everything about us. Every 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 um specifically specifically when it comes to the Jewish people, our whole being is to bring light to the world to, to serve Hashem. And that's why Hashem made us. And it made us into who we are. So there's no such thing as 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 the letter of the law. There's always whatever you're gonna do is gonna be part of making the of serving Hashem. If I'm gonna do extra beyond the letter of the law, so it's beyond what the Torah says I have to do, but so ultimately I'm just filling my purpose of making the of of serving God, serving God in ev- with every fiber of my being. Like it says that we're supposed to say. We're supposed to continuously ask ourselves. So, when will my actions, when will my deeds reach, become, become, um, when will I become as great as my, as our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Never. So, obviously never. But the point is that we have to, that we have to ask ourselves the question and what can I do better? Yes, I do all the mitzvahs, all 613 mitzvahs. I do everything properly. Fine. But what could I do better? I'm not as great as Abraham. I'm not as great, great as Isaac and Jacob. I'm never going to be. But I, ultimately, they were, they were, we've spoken before, that they were considered to be like chariots. We spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. Merkava, they were like, they were like, the, they were like the wheels of the chariot to serve God. They, they didn't have any self-being. They, everything was completely given over to God, just like a chariot, just like a, a carriage, a chariot that is, that is moved by the, by the rider, by the horse. The chariot doesn't have choice. So they were complete. They had choice. They gave themselves over to God with every fiber of their being. And the same thing it has to be with us. We have to continuously ask ourselves, how can I do better? How can I improve my ways that I should not only fulfill the law, but I should go beyond the letter of the law? So there's no such thing as there's no, no such thing as as finishing, finishing the job. I finished the job, and now I'm taking on extra. No. It's not extra. It's part of your, it's part of your essence. It's part of why you were created. A convert, on the other, other hand, has the luxury to say, "I was not given the, all the Torah and the mitzvahs. I was, I was given other, other jobs and things in the world." 
and I'm accepting this upon myself. This is beyond the letter of the law. We have that to a certain degree. So we have that to a certain degree. If we look at it from a different perspective, we'll get to that in a moment. That really we could say, otherwise, you know, all this this whole idea of Pukki Avod being beyond the, letter, beyond the letter of the law doesn't apply to us. So we're saying, yes, from a, a logical standpoint, based on what we're saying, it doesn't fully apply to us. But we have, there is something, inside, there is a, a part of us where we can kind of resonate with the convert and say, we also are taking upon extra upon ourselves. We don't see everything from God's perspective, where God created us to serve him. We, we, we see everything from our perspective. From our perspective, you know, never, never saying that we did enough is, is not a very compassionate um, way to go. And ultimately, Hashem gave us the mitzvahs and then taking on extra. And that's really, you know, what I, I think it's, everything is getting getting connected together over here, but it's no gas before. And this is really uh, the, the, the bigger question is why is Hashem obligated to give us reward altogether? We say in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Im Kabanim, Im Ka'avadim. Either we're like, we're like children or we're like slaves, like servants. A child is obligated to respect their parents. Kibud Ava'im. So the obligation of that we're talking about relationship of when we say we're like children or like servants, we mean the relationship that we have with God is either like a child with their parent or with a slave or servant with their master. When it comes to our relationship as a child with the parents, so obviously there's compassion and there's love and there's and everything else. From the child's from the child's end of things, the child has an obligation to respect the parent. And to to um to to give to give special honor to the parent. This is not a choice. We don't choose who our parents are. We are created. We are put into 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 a, into a family. We we a, a, a father and mother. We we brought, brought into a family, and now we have an obligation, in essence, to show them respect. It's not a reward. It's not a payment. It's not transactional. We don't pay them for their effort. The respect is deeper than that. The honor is there is there is an aspect of kibbutz of even respecting our parents, which the commentaries say is to, to thank them for their efforts, and that's really a, a payment that we have to pay for any caregiver. But beyond that, there is there is something in essence of a of a child's relationship with the parent. The child looks up to the parent, and the child is is obligated from the Torah to respect the parent. But even more than a child, we're not just children; we're also servants of God. A servant is be, belongs to the master. According to the Torah, we spoke about this last week, right? A, a servant belongs to the master, which means that they don't have an entity for themselves. Obviously, the master has to provide for their needs in order to for them to survive, mm-hmm. but they don't get they don't deserve. Maybe we don't. Maybe we might not agree with this ethically, based on in today's culture. But 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 according to the the law, they don't deserve anything. They are. They belong to the master. So if they find something, it says in in, in Jewish law, if if a if a servant is is taking a stroll on the road and finds a lost object, finds a piece of jewelry, that jewelry belongs to the master. The, the, the master sent them on the road in order, uh, not on the straw. The master sent them on the trip in order to go and do a work, to good, do a job for him, for for him or her. So the, this this servant belongs to the master. So everything they pick up belongs to the master. There's no such thing as payment for my effort. No, I belong to you. There's no my effort is never is never considered to be a not beyond the letter of the law that you should pay me more than that. So we belong to God. God created us. Our whole purpose was created to serve God. We don't have anything else in our lives. So we don't have entities for it. For, we don't have, you know, there's the part of me which is serving God. And then there's the part of me which is myself, my self-identity. Who, we don't have an identity. Our identity is a piece of God's creation to serve God, to make the world, to, to, to do what Hashem wants from us. 
which really brings out on a deeper level, on a stronger level, this the 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 question over here, or like if we look at it not from a convert's perspective, but from our perspective of, of of the Jewish people, we don't have anything that God should be paying us for our painstaking effort. Our painstaking effort is is a given. If that's what it takes, that's what it, that's what it takes. Hashem certainly doesn't have to pay us for the profit. Just has to give us what we need, just has to provide for us and so we can live in the world, so we can get we can we can we can be able to serve him, but not beyond that. So it's really about perspective. There's a perspective of Hashem from Hashem's end, and there's a perspective of from our end. From Hashem's end of things, this is true. We don't have any ident- identity. God chose to create us. He created us for one purpose, to serve him. We don't, there's no reward, there's no payment that would that we deserve. There's a there's a there's an aspect about Torah where we say that the Torah is compared to fire. It's it's beyond what we can touch. It's higher than us. And we say that fire can't become contaminated. We've spoken about it before that the Torah study, we, the Torah study can technically uh, take place even when somebody is impure. Because Torah can't become impure. Torah is higher than that. Torah is Hashem's words. Hashem's words don't get changed. They don't get diluted. They don't get affected when they come down in this world because they are, they are infinite. They are Hashem's essence. Hashem's essence can't be can't, it can't be um, um, it can't be affected or impacted by anything anything external. It's essential. It's essence. Just like our beings, our souls, we can we can have all sorts of sicknesses and we can have all sorts of ideas and we can have all sorts of of feelings or whatever it is, and we could be majorly affected by the external world. But our souls are pure and and our essence that can't be changed. The same thing with Torah, with God's word. Torah is God's word. Torah is God's essence. Hashem's mitzvahs are God's essence. These are things that can't be tampered with. It's pure. It comes from above. <laughs> this is like this is kind of the, the from Hashem's side of things. But then there's also a very human, down to earth part of serving God, of being Jewish, of doing the mitzvahs, of doing the Torah. We say that a if somebody has a lot of Torah knowledge. They have to be respected. Kavod, why do to respect them? Because of their Torah knowledge, not because of not because of them. They're just they're like everybody else. But they have they haven't they have all this Torah knowledge which deserves respect. But at the same time, if somebody disrespects them, they could pardon that person. They could say, you know what? I'm not, I'm you know, I'm not I'm not gonna take it to heart. I I am letting go, I am forgiving you for the disrespect. What do you mean? The disrespect was not to me. The disrespect was the Torah. It was the Torah, not me. The disrespect was not to the Torah scholar. This was disrespect was the Torah. Say no. Once a person learns Torah, it becomes theirs. It becomes it belongs to them. It becomes a part of them. We say Hashem gave us his Torah, and now it becomes our Torah. But Natan Lanu Baruch, we say the, the blessing of the Torah. Natan Lanu at Torah Torah. He gave us His Torah. He gave it to us. And now it becomes ours. So there is an aspect of Torah which is fire, which can't be tampered with. It comes from God. It's, it's everything. It's essential. But then there's a part of Torah which is it becomes mine, and I am forgiving you from the disrespect, even though I, even though the disrespect is not to, to, to not to the Torah scholar, it's, it's to the it's to somebody who represents Torah. It's not to the person, to the individual, it's to their representation of Torah, but they are forgiving because it became, became their Torah and they are able to forgive for their, for their disrespect. Mm-hmm. In mitzvahs, you have some mitzvahs that it says that we have to give up our lives for, right? If we're, we're told, bow down to the cross or you'll, or you'll lose your life, we have to give up our lives. Same thing with adultery, the same thing with murder. And there are situations when even for more simple mitzvahs, a person has to give up their lives. In times of um, in times of um, shmat, how do you say? Is in times of um, um, when when they're trying when when they're trying to um, when 
the, the government or whatever it is is trying trying specifically to ban practice of Torah, like in times of, of Hanukkah, the Jewish people gave up their lives for the simple things like not eating not eating pork or not violating Shabbat because these were because violating them was represent was was so to speak showing that they're giving in to the Greeks. So there are times when we are obligated to give up our lives even for, even for more smaller mitzvahs. But then there are many mitzvahs that we're told you're not allowed to give up your life for. If there's if it's not the time of Shema, it's not a time when they're trying to to ban Torah. But somebody says, you know, you, you know I'm saying we know we know clearly if somebody is sick, we violate the Shabbat. You're obligated to violate the Shabbat if somebody is sick. You're obligated to give them non-kosher food if they need non-kosher food. All of the mitzvahs we can violate, they're not it's not violating. It's actually a bit. It's actually it's actually doing Hashem's will. Hashem says, I want you to put away the mitzvah in order to to in order to live, in order to be alive. Mm-hmm. These are two these are two two aspects. On the one hand, we belong to God. Hashem says, "Give up your life. You won't bow down. You don't bow down. Don't bow down to the cross. That represent that. This is something that you have to give up your life for. Because if your if your whole purpose of being created is to serve God, if you're able to stand up and declare otherwise, then you don't. Then that that is worth giving up your life for that. Because your life has no worth." <clears throat> As a as an identity, which as a being which was created to serve me, if you denounce me, but then there are mitzvahs where Hashem says, "No, don't give up your life. Your life is more important. You have to be alive and do mitzvahs." This is from a different angle. This is from the angle of we count, we matter, we do have an identity. Pirkei Avot, the first mission of Pirkei Avot begins. Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Or from Mount Sinai. Interesting question is why it says from Mount Sinai, not from God. But Moses received the Torah. It doesn't say God gave us, gave Moses the Torah at Mount Sinai. It says Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Because we're talking about the receiving end of things. Hmm. All of the ethics of the fathers, all of the beyond the letter of the law, only applies when we look at things from a receiving end. When we look at things from the giving end, from Hashem's end, there is no such thing as, as, as your identity and your beyond, going beyond the letter of the law. You did, you did, you did your painstaking effort beyond what you were obligated to do. No, you're obligated to do everything. There's no end. Whatever you do is not not enough because you're not like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're not yet a chariot to God. You're not completely. You're not bound up with God in that that level. So it's only possible from the end of the, the receiver. And ultimately, it says that when we got the Torah at Mount Sinai, we became converts. That's when we became Jewish. So we're, talk- we're getting ready to receive the Torah the, the next, wait, yeah, Shavuot is, the end, is next weekend. So next uh, week on Friday is Shavuot. So week on Thursday night through Saturday night. And when we got the Torah at Mount Sinai, it wasn't just that we were given our laws, but that's when we really became a nation. Or when we when we finalized our becoming a nation from the from when we left Egypt, that's when we became Jewish. That's when we accepted upon ourselves the Torah. We say that Hashem offered the Torah to the different nations, and we were the ones that accepted it upon ourselves. So we took on extra than we were obligated to. We took on beyond the letter of the law. So that's what the whole Pirkei Avot represents. Moshe Kibel Torah means that Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. There was the receiving end. There's the accepting upon ourselves. We're all like taking on what we're not obligated to do and ultimately that plays out when it comes to things which are beyond the letter of the law so yes we do the mitzvahs and the torah but then there are things that we don't have to do but we do them because we want because we want to be extra pious extra ethical and moral in, in our behaviors and that's where we say the fum agra according to the painstaking effort is the reward from our end of things from our end of things, when we take on something beyond the letter of the law, Hashem says, I'm going to pay you for that also. I'm not going to leave it only at paying you and rewarding you for doing the mitzvahs. Like it says in Bechukotai, I'm going to give you even for extra than that. There's, there's a little bit more to this. I've got to stop here, but there's a little bit more in the Mishnah before, in the in the piece beforehand where Ben Bagbag speaks a similar teaching. Ben Bagbag was also a convert. And Bag, 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 Basin, Bag is eight Gimel. Bet and Gimel, two and three together makes five. It's also the hay, but it's more hidden. It's deeper. It's, it's a little bit of a deeper dimension. But uh, I think we get we gave over the basic teaching and the basic idea.
Um, yes, Shira. So um, what is the generally understood um, meaning of reward in this context? Is it spiritual reward? Is it material reward? Is it what what reward is there here? And and it seems to be kind of like a dichotomy because on the one hand, um, the idea being to serve Hashem because that's who we are in the world, um, with no thought of any other purpose. And then here it says, you know, so shall be the reward. So it seems like the two things are in conflict with each other. It's a great question. I think it says also in Pirkei Avot, in, in the first chapter, it says, don't be like the servants that serve the master in order to get a reward. Rather, you should do it without looking to get a reward. So we have these conflicting ideas in the whole Torah, back and forth. Sometimes where we're like, who are you? You have no identity. You don't deserve anything. And other times where it speaks about reward, many times where it speaks about reward, especially in the, in, the, in the Bible. Many, many verses that talk about reward and punishment. So right, so... The, the Rambam goes into, into great length in explaining this, both in his in his um, eight-chapter book, I think, Shmona Prakim, and also in Mishnah Torah, and in the book, and in, and in Guide for Perplexed. And he says that there's different levels in our service of God. Ultimately, we start off at a level where we need reward. We all start off as children. Children need reward, payment. Like, there's no such thing as a child, as like, as, you know, expecting children to do things just purely because they're right. There, there is. But there is also a certain level of making them want to do it, making them excited about it through reward until they start to appreciate and love doing it for what it really is. So there is, there's a build, it's a buildup. And there are times when we, we might be tuning in to the, the chariot level, where we say, I'm fully for God. That's a very difficult place to be. It doesn't come easily. And ultimately Hashem accepts and Hashem sees the fact that we are human. And we are, we do need reward. And that's where Pirkei Avot comes to tell us many times, yes, try to be like the servant that does things without getting reward, but don't give up if you can't get there. It says if you start off, if we learn Torah, not for, not Lishma, not, not with the right, um, not with the right um, intention, ultimately we'll get to a place where we're eventually we're able to do it with the right intention. So it's, it's a buildup. And the reward, the other question is, what is the reward that we're talking about? That is a different, it's a, it's a long discussion in itself you know we spoke i think last year we had a class about um shilu and sending away the the, the mother bird and there's a whole idea of reward with that and um, which we spoke about at length like that um ultimately we don't always see the reward in our lifetime after sometimes the world can reward can be in the world to come and the true the greatest reward is to be connected to hashem so we say schar mitzvah mitzvah the reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah what does that mean exactly? What do you mean? I did a mitzvah. You're in another mitzvah? Yeah, because a mitzvah means connection with God. It means bond with God. So the reward for doing the mitzvah is bonding with God. It is the reward pays back within the actual act of doing it. And the more we, the more the Ramam says, the more that we connect with God, so the more Hashem gives us the opportunity to connect with Him. So that so He takes He gives us materialism and spiritual, He gives us all the things that we need so we can focus on serving Him more. The biggest desire, the Rambam says in the last law of his book, the biggest desire of all the prophets and all of the wise people, the Chachamim and the Nevi'im, for, for Mashiach to come, is not so they could be, not so they can have abundance and all these things, but so they could study Torah and be connected with God. When Mashiach comes, all the, all the material difficulties will be taken away so we can focus on serving God. So the highest reward is the reward is, is the connection. But obviously, in order to get there, the Hashem, there's the, all of the other things, the peace and the and 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 the sustenance and rain and all the other things that we spoke about in last week's parsha. And I know that we are instructed to serve Hashem in a, I don't know, to make our make our mitzvot beautiful, right? Um, does that also come from the same source? You know. Uh, Beautiful, which is, beautiful. I don't know if it's beautiful. I don't know what the word is. Uh, my friend has to told me about this. Um, that I don't know, I guess, like you know, we don't wear a shmata over our head, you know, we make a beautiful yarmulke. Um, we make these things beautiful to um, to serve Hashem. We don't. Which is, I guess, going beyond the literal. It is. It is. It is. It says. It, it says. Um, 
this is my God and I will beautify. It says, and I will beautify him. So this is, this is the source for the fact. It says in Talmud and other places that we have to be, we're supposed to beautify our mitzvahs. Choose the most beautiful esrach and, and, and get the best, the best matzah, get the best, enjoy Shabbat, do everything at the, at, at the most be- in the most beautiful way that we really appreciate and enjoy doing the mitzvah. So this is the, I think this is what, um, what Robin is referring to. And this is true. Is obvious the, the more that we are connected with God, the more we want to go beyond the letter of the law and do things, even if, even though, you know, with this the basic obligation, the dry obligation, we want to do more than that. The right. best holiday that represents that is Hanukkah. Because on Hanukkah, we all light. So we all add in candles every night. And every person in the home does that. And it says that this is, the, according to the basic law, we're only obligated to light one candle each night and one candle per house. But we go mahadrim in mahadrim. We go extra beautiful. And that's beca- now that became accepted upon all Jewish people that we go beyond the letter of the law. Ultimately, to do the mitzvah of Hanukkah, we only did one candle. I didn't know that. I thought you needed mahadrin mina mahadrin. Not right. only do we add, do we have a menorah for every family member? We have an extra candle every night. So if you have eight family members in the house on the eighth night, you have eighty candles. Wow. No, no, no. If you have ten family members on the eighth night, you have eighty candles. Uh, biblically, according to the not biblically, rabbinically, according to the, the law in the Talmud, one candle is enough. Anyways, that's great. Very good. Thank you. This was great. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And um, upcoming events, we have Tim Sherney's doing a, a pre shavuot gathering tomorrow evening. Oh, um, cool. if, if, um, in case anybody missed the email for women. And um, next Friday is Shavuot. So we're going to have a Torah reading in the afternoon, 5.30 p.m. And pro- most probably outdoors um, if the weather permits. And it's, so we'll be able to reaccept the Torah for the 300 and for in year for year three 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 five. It'll be the, the, the number of times that we receive the Torah. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week.